Good morning, everyone. Am I in the right position here for the camera? Great, OK. Thank you for tuning in this morning. Um, wherever you are, you might be in your pyjamas, you might be in a suit, I don't know. Or you might be on the bus in the week watching it back. It's great to have you here this morning. Thank you for joining us. And uh, my name's Nick, and I'm going to be following on um, in the series of Luke. And um, where we are in the story of Luke is that um, Jesus has gathered um, a number of followers to him. There are probably, you know, hundreds of people following him. And he's working his way through what is now modern day Israel. He's working his way to the climax of his story, uh, which is in Jerusalem and where he was crucified and resurrected. He's gathered 12 disciples to him. And uh, he, as he's going, he's uh, doing miracles, he's teaching, he's telling people about the coming kingdom of God. And uh, last week, Tom picked up on this a bit. He uh, talked about how Jesus, in this process, went to parties. He, he, he lived everyday life with people. And uh, how Jesus actually has a feast for us now uh, in, this, in, the, in our lives now, but also we have a, an eternity to look forward to where one day we will be feasting with God for eternity. What an exciting prospect. And I'm going to carry on um, the story in Luke chapter 14 and going to be looking at verses 25 to 35. So if you uh, are able to, if you could grab your Bibles or whatever you've got looking at the Bible on this morning, and I think it's going to come up on the screen in front of you and I will, I will read. Here we go. Now great crowds accompanied him and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to mock him, saying, This man, he began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the, so for the soil or the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, these are tough words that Jesus is saying, and I hear you saying through the internet to me, hang on a mo, hang on a mo, Nick, what is this all about? Where does this sit with, what the other, with other things that Jesus has said? So Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, or peace I will give you, my peace I give you, or... or Love one another as I have loved you. And, you know, this isn't in line with that message, is it? Hate your mother, hate your father, take, take your cross. And where does this sit in the rest of Scripture? You know, it, doesn't, it's, it says elsewhere in the Bible, honour your mother and father. Where does this sit with that? Is Jesus contradicting himself? You know, is, has he gone completely bonkers? You know, what is going on here? What does he mean by this? And if, you're, if I'm honest, and if you're honest, does, does this passage make you feel a bit uncomfortable, maybe? I know I've read this in the past, and if I'm honest with you, I've kind of skipped over it a bit because I don't really want to think about the consequence of what this might mean for me. Now, this passage is an uncomfortable passage. And this morning, what I want to do is just unpick exactly what Jesus is saying here. What is it he's getting at? What is he trying to say to these hundreds of people that are following him? You know, what is it that his message is here? Well, a few months ago, I went in for some minor surgery on my, on my hand. And I walked into the clinic. I, I sat down. 
The nurse uh, came up to me, she took my details, she um, took my blood pressure, made sure that I was you know, still alive. And then, um, and then the surgeon came along. And the surgeon sat down, he looked at my notes, and he taught me through the procedure. He said, you know, I'll be cutting here, I'll be cutting there, and uh, this is what might happen, this is what it will feel like, this is what might not happen. And by the end of the, um, the conversation with the surgeon, I was in absolutely no doubt what I was letting myself in for. And in the same way here, in this passage, Jesus is making it absolutely clear to the disciples, to those people following him, and to you and me this morning, what it, might, what it may mean to follow him. It is a privilege to follow Jesus, and I will be the first to say this. It's changed my life. It's incredible. In Jesus, you will find life. You will find peace. You will find forgiveness for your sins. You will, I know that I will spend eternity with him. But Jesus is saying here, if you follow me, there will be a cost. If you follow me, weigh up your options carefully before you commit to this. This is what he was, why he was using that, that picture of the man building a house or a king going to war. Weigh up your options before you commit. If you follow me, be sure that there will be many things that might distract you and try and pull you away, and it's not going to be an easy ride. But unlike my surgeon, who sat me down and told me the worst-case scenario, who actually wasn't going to have surgery that day, Jesus put his money where his mouth was. He was already on this journey. And when he turned to those crowds and said this, he was already on a journey. He was on a journey that would eventually cause him to give up everything to rescue you and I, to rescue mankind from sin, to make a way possible for our relationship with God to be restored. And I want you to hear this this morning before I talk about anything else, that Jesus never asks us to do anything that he wasn't prepared to do himself. It says in Hebrews 4 verse 15 that um, Jesus is able to sympathize with our weaknesses and because he was tempted and he suffered in every way. And this is tough stuff. Jesus is giving us, he was giving his followers and giving us today as his followers a reality check here. He's leaving us in no doubt what it means to follow him. And incidentally, and I'm not going to dwell on this this morning, but incidentally, this is actually in stark contrast, isn't it, often to what some churches or some Christians have preached in, in, over time. Sometimes we hear people say, follow me, follow Jesus, as if we're selling a commodity, and you'll do well in your job, or you'll get a large car, or you'll get a nice house, or your troubles will cease. Well, Jesus never said that. And this is a passage where we, we're absolutely clear about that. Now, I'm not going to dwell on that. I'm going to leave that to one side. But that's just a thought I want to put in there. So is Jesus really saying that we should hate our parents? Is he really saying that? Is that really what he's getting at here? And this is a difficult verse to hear because it sounds so anti-family, doesn't it? It sounds, Jesus' words, they sound disrespectful. They, you know, it, it conflicts with our values, which is probably why it's so hard sometimes to read these things. But what Jesus is doing here is he's using exaggeration for effect. Jesus is not calling us to hate our father and mother, but instead he's calling us to a commitment above all other commitments including commitment to family. And I think we need to look at this in the context of the culture of his day. It, family in Jesus' time was absolutely everything. And often in British culture, I think, and recently in British culture, we've probably lost the sense of this. But in Jesus' time, family ties, looking after your family, loyalty to the family name were a lot stronger. And I think in other cultures in the world today, probably this would make more sense. But in our culture, could it be hate your money, hate your comfort, hate your ambitions, or hate your rights? Hate in this context is not a call 
to develop a, an intense dislike for family members or whatever, but it's rather a call to love them less than Jesus. And Jesus is making it clear here that he demands commitment. We can't enter into a, a relationship with him half-heartedly. It's all or nothing. Now, I've been a Christian for, I don't know, 30, over 30, 35 years. I can't remember exactly. Um, and I can honestly say it's been, it's incredible. It's wonderful knowing Jesus. But there are moments in my Christian walk where I know that I am not fully committing everything to him. There are times, maybe minutes, with attitudes, maybe weeks, months, with maybe issues of unforgiveness or things that I think, you know, I'm not surrendering this to Jesus. And I call those times my miserable place. <laughs> I call those times my miserable place because I feel miserable. When you know Jesus, when you have truly met with him, you know when things aren't fully surrendered to him. And let me be clear here, and I'm going to talk a bit more about this later. This isn't Jesus being nasty to us. <laughs> this is self-inflicted. This is me inflicting this on myself because I should know better. And I'm going to talk a bit about that later. But what does this commitment actually mean? And I think as, as Christians, often when we think about the cost of following Jesus, when we think about, you know, kind of strong, tough commitment, we first of all maybe go to missionary pioneers, don't we? People who have given up family, home, country, life, even, even their own lives to follow Jesus. And as a young man, I fed myself on, on autobiographies and biographies of such people People like Jim Elliot, Gladys Aylward, you know, Jackie Pullinger, Hudson Taylor. And I would encourage you to do the same. They fill you with faith and, and, and uh, just such, such excitement for what God can do through normal people. But everyday life, doesn't it, throws up many decisions and actions where there's a cost involved, where our commitment is te to Jesus is tested. And... Uh, this morning, because of the way I think, I've tried to categorise some of these things into five categories. The first thing is culture, isn't it? Maybe you're the only one who's not prepared to gossip at work or at the school gate. And maybe because of that, sometimes you feel lonely. You feel a bit ostracised. Or maybe you're seen as, as, as different at school or uni or work because you don't swear, you don't blaspheme, you don't you know, say rude things. Or you don't go out and get drunk on a Friday night or at the Christmas party. Not that we can do that now, but you know what I mean. <laughs> or financial. Maybe you're being compelled to make different financial decisions to what people would normally do or people in the world would do. You know, giving to the church, giving to the poor, giving to those in need maybe forgetting a certain comfort in order to use your money on others. Or time, maybe giving up of your time to help someone, to help a neighbour, help a work colleague, to support someone, to encourage someone, to serve in the church. Or ambitions, maybe turning down a promotion at work or not working the hours that everyone else works at work so that you can spend more time with your family and your children or maybe giving up a promising career because you know Jesus is saying, I want you to go there. I want you to do this instead. Or attitudes, maybe sexual abstinence, waiting for the day that you're married to have sex. Or maybe not getting into pointless relationships with boys or girls because you want to wait for the person that God has got for you. Or maybe ensuring that your business expenses are completely honest. Whatever it is, and there's many more examples, this is the everyday cost. This is the everyday commitment. This is what it means to follow Jesus. And Jesus compares his followers to, to salt. And he does this, he uses this analogy a lot. Now, a few years ago, and I've got permission to say this story, okay? A few years ago, it was my birthday. And uh, my birthday is just before Christmas. We had, some we had toddlers at that time, so life was busy. And uh, Corrie made me a birthday cake. 
and it was, it was wonderful, my favourite, carrot cake, okay? We, she got it out, we, we put the candles on, we sang happy birthday, we blew the candles out, we cut the cake, everyone was really excited. We got off spoons and forks, if you're posh, and, uh, and then started to put a mouthful in our mouths and, you know, spat it out. What's wrong with it? And uh, it, Corey had got our measurements wrong. <laughs> and there was too much salt in it. And it was disgusting. <laughs> and I know it wasn't deliberate because she had a bit herself. And, uh, <laughs> and it just made me think of this analogy that Jesus is saying here. When there's too much salt, you notice it. When there's not enough salt, you notice it. Salt is meant to be noticed. And we, as Christians, are here to be noticed. We're here to point the world to Jesus. We're here to point the world to Jesus' ways. We're here to point the world to the hope that, we bring, that he brings. And we must not lose this saltiness. I want to ask you today, how salty are you? If you are, look yourself in the mirror this morning and, said, and honestly appraised yourself, how salty are you this morning? And I hear you crying, Nick, stop it. This is tough stuff. Is there any good, new, any good stuff here? Well, yes, it is tough. But then I would say back to you, well, is it really? Is it really tough? Because all that we do as Christians is in the context, isn't it, of what Jesus has done for us, of his great love for us of the incredible grace of God our Father. The Bible is absolutely clear. We were hopeless cases. We were dead, spiritually dead, blinded. We were heading to an eternity without God. Take this world and all the goodness in it and then take God out of it. That's what we were heading for until we were rescued. Rescued from our sin. Rescued by God who sent his son, Jesus, to die for us. Rescued by Jesus who willingly paid the ultimate cost of dying in our place. We were picked up, we were brushed down, and we've been given new life. And when we hear these tough words of Jesus, let's never lose sight of where we came from and what he has done for us. And we enter into this commitment to Jesus never out of guilt or condemnation, but out of new life given to us by God, a loving relationship which motivates us to serve him. And I, just to kind of illustrate this point, I want to look at something that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Philippi in Philippians 3 verse uh, 7. I'm going to read this to you. Paul said, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now, Paul was a clever man. Tom was talking about Pharisees last week. He was a Pharisee, a teacher of the law, a man of authority, a man of power, respected, respectable. But you know what he said? He said, all of that past, all that I had, all that I was, total rubbish compared to knowing Jesus. And because he knew Jesus, because he served Jesus, he suffered many things. Read the book of Acts. Have a look at what he had to go through. He was beaten, shipwrecked. He was arrested. He was bitten by a snake, left for dead, laughed at, mocked, misunderstood, and more. And he says here in this passage, you know what? None of that was a, is a badge of honor. None of that makes me righteous. It's rubbish compared to knowing Jesus, compared to the righteousness that I have by faith in Jesus. And he says, you know why? In verse, first part of verse 9, because now I'm found in Jesus. And so are you and I. We are found in Jesus this morning. We are new creations. He says in the second part of verse 9, because now I'm righteous. I've been made right 
Um, by, I've been made right with God through Jesus. And so have you and I. In verse 11, he says, because I have an eternal hope. And so do you and I this morning. We will be resurrected. We, will ha- we have eternal life. And this is what motivated Paul. And this should motivate us regardless of the cost. Let's take heed of Jesus' words this morning. Let's take these words seriously, that if we choose to follow him, there will be a cost. But let's also remember what Jesus said. He said, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And in commitment to Jesus, we find life. And this is what Paul was talking about. This is what millions of Christians before us have experienced. This is what these heroes of the faith that I mentioned earlier knew. John Wesley, the 18th century preacher, who saw thousands of people uh, coming to know Jesus, he was fearless in, in proclaiming the gospel. And he was part of a movement that brought massive social reform to this country. He said this, He said, give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God, and I care not a straw whether they're clergymen or laymen. I don't care what their background is. Such alone, these people alone, will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. God has called us to shake this earth. We live in a society a culture, a world that is lost, is unsure of itself. It's without a clear morality. It's, it's, people are blind. Proverbs 29 verse 2 says, When the righteous increase, the people rejoice. I want you to hear this morning that the world needs us. The world needs our message. The world needs our message of Jesus, of hope. We have a voice. We have a, mi- a mission to bring hope to this world. Here's some true life stories. A friend of the family whose mum and dad have split up and is so hurt, so scared of commitment, so against marriage now, that they want just fluid relationships. This is what they've told us. Because they don't want to put anyone or themselves through that hurt that they've been through. In families with Jesus in the center of them, we have a model of family that we can bring to this world. Or another friend whose little, uh, his young girl in primary school is under pressure to get a, a phone. All her friends are on Facebook, Twitter, there's gossip, there's slander, there's horrible stuff going on at such an early age. Well, in Jesus' culture, we build one another up, don't we? We see the best in people. What a positive impact we can have on this world. Or what about the 200,000 fetuses aborted last year in the UK? Or the debate on assisted dying? We have a powerful message, a voice to bring about the sanctity of life, about the fact that every life has been created by a loving God. Or what about the 5,000 or 6,000 people who committed suicide last year in the UK? It's actually higher than that, that figure, I just want to add. But we have a hope, we have a love, we have the healing power of God that can truly save people from hopelessness, that, that makes them take their own lives. We have good news, we have a better way to live, don't we? Through the love, the grace and the teaching of Jesus. As the band I'm going to come up now. We're going to finish with a, a song in a minute, and I'm going to pray. But I just want to remind us again of those five areas of commitment. And I just want you to think about the impact that you and I could have on society if these five areas are truly surrendered to Jesus. Think about the impact that we could have on society if we are changing culture if our finances are surrendered, if our time is surrendered, if our ambitions, our attitudes are truly surrendered to Jesus, are those things truly surrendered in your life? Are you salt in your sphere of influence? Let's let our rescue, our relationship with God, motivate us and spur us on, not to give up, even 
if there is a cost. I'm going to pray, and if anything that I've said this morning has stirred you, challenged you, spoken to you, then you know, pray with the, if, you're, if, you, if you're with someone, pray with them, talk to them about it. If you want to contact someone in the church, please do. We would love to support you through that. Okay, Lord Jesus, thank you for what you have done for us. Thank you that you considered equality with God, nothing to be grasped. You gave up everything to save us. Thank you, Jesus, that you paid the ultimate price. And we want to live our lives that are worthy of that. We want to give everything that we have to you, our time, our ambitions, our money, our you know, how we impact culture, how we behave in, with our colleagues, our friends, our family. We want to give it all to you, Father. We need your help. We need your grace. We need your strength in this. Please bless us this week. Help us to make an impact wherever we are. Amen.